Ready then. Everything should be recording properly. Mike is unmuted. Everything should be ready to go, so... Hello, everyone. Welcome back to r slash no sleep. Uh, this time around, I found some stories about government officials. Or, like... Like, cover up, like, stories from the government. Or, like, something like that. Um, I also have some of the updates or, like, continuations of previous stories from last time. And I also have a bonus story just because I felt like five would be better than four. So I'm not good with intros, so let's just get right into it with the first story. Um, but, well, before I say that, I just woke up, so if I sound a bit nasally, that's why. So, anyways... I'm a sailor in the Navy. On my last deployment, we uncovered the origin of human existence. Now I wish I could forget it. Thank you, uh, lawnmower dude outside my window. I appreciate it. The sail was classified as top secret. Whatever we were doing out there, they didn't want anybody to know. Not the Russians, not the Chinese, not the public, and certainly not the crew. We'd been kept in the dark, fed the lie that we were headed, heading out on a routine patrol. Up and down the coast, they said. Back in no time, actually. Okay, I just wanted to make sure the, the volume was fine. Um, because I don't know if I readjusted it. Sorry. Um, up and down the coast, they said. Back in no time. That was before the storm, before the sea turned into a maelstrom, and the night swallowed the sun. It was before the captain slit his throat, and before the crew tossed themselves overboard, desperate to escape the nightmare we had fished out, at, out of the sea. It was the light. It was the light that the people saw. Uh, my name is Walter Mills. I suppose I should probably use an alias, something to prevent the people above from finding me, but the truth is, I don't care. I've spent my entire life caring, my entire life running from the shadows that sit, sit above our government from the puppet masters that pull the strings of the world. But I'm out of time, and I mean that literally. I got one foot in the grave, Doc says I'm term- Doc says it's terminal. That means I don't have to worry about the wrong people finding me or the consequences of what I'm about to say. I can let you know, and then I can go. The sail began like any other. Our warship was tied up alongside. The crew formed up in lines, running from the jetty to the lower deck, storing it full of food and supplies. It began uniform, ordinary, then they arrived. The secret ones. Nobody seemed to know who they were, but when they came, they wore masks of crimson, like balaclavas without holes for the eyes or mouth. They shoved past our line on the brow and told the quartermaster they needed to speak with the captain, and speak they did. I watched them from the edge of my vision, all six of them surrounding the captain, mumbling in words too quiet to properly make out. The conversation lasted 20 minutes, and by the end, the captain was frowning. He made a call ashore, presumably to the Commodore. He seemed nervous, afraid. When the call finished, he said something dismissively to the secret ones and vanished below decks. We all wondered what was going on. But those of you that have served, you know that there's two things that keep a crew entertained. Pirated movies and rumors. And after that exchange, the rumors flew. Some said the secret ones were special forces, so clandestine that nobody was permitted to see their faces. Others said that they were intelligence operators, people with access to such sensitive intel that knowing their faces could prove a national security risk. Briggs, a stoker in the engine room, joked that they were, they were Illuminati, lizards from Mars. I didn't know what they were, to be honest, I didn't really care. I just wanted to get the sail over with so I could get home to see my wife, Abby, and our newborn, Alice. For me, this was a job, a stepping stone to a better life. And when we set sail, I still believed that. Then the ship dropped anchor and the crew was mustered into the hangar. The captain stood at the front with three of the secret ones on either side of them, side of him. They stood silent, gazing out at us behind their crimson masks. 
The captain cleared his throat and said this was difficult for him to do. But prior to our departure, he received word that our mission had changed, that it was no longer routine, no, no longer what we expected. Give me one second. I'm still rather sick from yesterday, so... I'm gonna have to keep blowing my nose, which is gross. I apologize. He passed a bottle of pills around. Each of us was instructed to take a pill from the bottle to keep it safe, to keep it on our person at all times, in case of emergency, but never to eat it otherwise. What is it, sir? Briggs asked in the back. Cyanide, the captain replied. Laughter rippled across the crew. Seriously? Somebody else called? This is f this from malaria? Are we deploying? The captain sighed, looking sidelong at the secret ones who remained silent, impassive. It's cyanide. And if you know what's good for you, you make sure you don't lose it. With that, he stormed off, secret ones in tow. That night, Briggs died. He tried the capsule, swore up and down that the whole thing was a dumb joke. That there was no fucking way they'd give us cyanide capsules when they didn't even trust us to clean toilets unsupervised. His last words? It probably tastes like Smarties. Briggs died quick. He died quick in a seizing, sputtering mess of shit and piss. But once his organs gave out, it, it only took a matter of seconds. Carrying his corpse through the ship took minutes. Minutes that felt like hours. Once we'd made it to the med bay, the doc tried resuscitating him. Tried pumping his stomach, but he knew as well as we did that it was a waste of time. He was gone, long gone. After that, we all assumed we'd turn straight around and head home. That we'd drop off. Briggs' body, pay our respects, and take a couple days to grieve before resuming the mission. But the captain informed us the show would go on. We wouldn't be turning around, we wouldn't be dropping off Briggs' corpse because this mission was classified as a no-fail. Not only that, but the ship would be going into lockdown, shutting off all communication to River City. Do I need to sneeze? I don't know. That meant no way to call home, no way for us, no way for home to call us. We were isolated and alone. And then the captain had the nerve to tell us that things were going to get worse, that Briggs' death, tra tragic as it may have been, was likely to be the tip of our iceberg. The crew was furious, confused. Most of all, though, we were heartbroken. Many of us threw our cyanide capsules out, hating the memory they represented. Three days passed after Briggs' death, three days of mourning, of the ship steaming through the Pacific while its crew slowly came undone, whispering theories about what we were doing out there, about what the captain meant by things getting worse. It's China, I overheard in the flats. They've got a secret weapon and we're going to dismantle it. I saw a YouTube video on this. If they catch us, though, they're gonna torture the fuck out of us. And that's why they gave us the cyanide. Fuck that, you sound totally nuts. It's Russia, dummy. Gotta be, they're going nuclear and we got words, so now we're going to sink their subs. Why do you, why do you mean why? Well, what do you mean why? Then they can't second strike us after we glass them at, glass them. It ain't genocide if we got no choice. <laughs> I didn't know what to think. I never experienced anything like this, so I just woke up. Did my watches and went back to bed, rinse for Pete. I tried not to talk about what was going on because every time I did, Briggs's, Briggs inevitably came up and the memory hurt like a knife to the gut. He and I had gone through basic together, sailed up and down the Pacific Northwest and made a game of binding old coins in every port. So I just kept my head down, did my work. I was doing that work when the captain's warning came true when things got worse. It was a night watch, and I had been steering the ship on the bridge. One moment we were sailing through smooth waters in a bright, cloudless night. The next moment it all disappeared. Darkness stole the evening like a light switch to set to off. I recalled the watch officer moving onto the bridge wings and staring up at the sky, trying to determine if the moon had slipped behind a cloud. When we came back, you looked confused, shaken. 
It was odd to me because we had radars, so it wasn't like we were navigating blind. We call he called the captain and reported that the moon was missing, gone. Stay the course, Captain commanded. But sir, click, the line went dead. The next morning, the sun never rose. The sky remained as black as and haunting as the night before. Around this time, the secret ones began acting more bizarre. Whereas before they they more or less stayed put in their cabins, they now wandered the ship aimlessly. They'd mumble nonsense under their breaths as you passed them in the flats, run their hands over surfaces everywhere they went. Every so often, you catch a couple of them heading to the upper decks with a small ham radio and a portable antenna. They'd set it up and sit there for hours. Mostly, they didn't speak into the microphone, they just listened to the static buzz of the speaker. Every so often, you'd hear them screech into the mic. Once I saw one crying into it, just weeping quietly, hands clutching the sides of their head. The crew's discussion became more erratic. Talk of, talk of Russian or Chinese superweapons, mostly valent, vanished. Now the going theory was that they were making contact with aliens, that we'd located a downed spacecraft and were attempting to communicate with it. That's why the sky's gone all fucky. It's alien cloaking technology designed to keep their crafts hidden. If we get it first, then we'll be we will be able to travel to different planets and shit. The guys in red work for Elon Musk, SpaceX. What do you mean how do I know? I asked one. No way. I told you the Russians were going to nuke us and now they did. Why do you think it's so fucking dark, man? Nuclear winter. All the ash and soot and blotted out the sun, dummy. Neither theory was close to the truth. Nobody on board had any idea just how bad things were, and how bad things they were gonna get. If we had, then we'd have staged a mutiny right then and there, and turned the ship around and gone back the way we came, but we didn't. We sailed into the night. The following week passed in confusion and despair. The crew became more irritable. People who were usually chipper were suddenly snapping at one another. Fighting over the littlest things, errant comments became verbal meltdowns in the space of seconds. Cold coffee led to fist fights. Missing toilet paper left a sailor with a black eye and a bloody nose. But those were manageable problems, not so far out of the ordinary that we weren't equipped to understand them. To deal with them, what happened in the gym between Myers and Yendel, though, that was something none of us were equipped to deal with. <coughs> Yendale was spotting Myers on the bench press. I don't know what was said, I wasn't there. All of my information was second hand, but according to witnesses, an argument started when Yendale accused Myers of sabotaging their marriage. Words flew, Myers went to rack his bar, but Yendale kicked the bar down, 200 pounds, and nearly decapitated him. It better, it'd been better if it had. Myers was still alive when the doc arrived, his neck had been severely bat has se his neck had been severed badly hanging by strips of flesh but his eyes were still moving his throat was still choking yendo sat bawling in the corner screaming that she didn't mean to that she never wanted to hurt him but couldn't stop herself she screamed as they dragged her away as they locked her up Myers didn't live much longer the doc put him out of his misery the fastest way he could think of by finishing the job Ugh. The rest of the crew got to work cleaning up the blood. As for Yendo, she died an hour later. Tur turns out she never threw out her cyanide capsule, and she finally got her chance to use it. At the time, I felt awful for them. Awful for Myers to suffer the way he did. And awful for Yendo because I knew exactly what she meant. She never meant to hurt anybody. That some dark miasma had infected the ship had seeped into our hearts, minds, and it had made us angry. Second. That night I thought of her, of what she might have looked like after she swallowed her cap cyanide capsule, of how easy it could have been to escape this nightmare if I'd never flushed mine. Then my thoughts turned to my wife, my daughter, 
Guilt filled my stomach like a pit of vipers, snapping at me for even thinking of leaving them behind. I drifted off, my dreams were messy things. Hopeless, twisted, I dreamt of Briggs' spirit wandering the ship, unable to find peace so far, my, so far from home, trapped in a steel cage like a rat. When I awoke, my mind felt like mush. I stumbled through the flats like a zombie, each step more plodding and heavy than the last. My ears rang, my vision blurred, I half wondered whether I'd been drugged or if there was a carbon monoxide leak in the mess, but then something caught my eye, the secret one's, the secret one's cabin, the door was cracked open barely, it was never open. I peeked in, spotting one of them, sitting at a desk, with their back to me, the lights were out, a low sound played in the room, something resembling music, but decidedly off tune and agonizing. Like a violin strings being stripped and sanded, I used it to cover my footsteps as, as I slipped inside, eyeing the secret one as it sat rigid in its seat. It wasn't wearing its mask, at least not properly. It had lifted it up to its eyes, except it had none. No eyes, no nose, and only a tiny round hole that passed for a mouth. Heart pounding, I gazed at this thing in the thin light from it from the flats, suddenly understanding why they were running their hands over everything on the ship. They were navigating, scouting. It lifted a finger to its face, tra tracing along a series of scattered wounds, some still bleeding. With its with a whimper, its nail plunged into its cheek. A pool of blood formed around it. The secret one moaned. Slowly, it peeled off a small strip of flesh, then another. It placed them down on the desk, humming its humming in tune with the distorted music. And the flesh began to writhe. It began to twist and reshape. The secret one felt with its hands, nodded to itself. Then it pulled a file dossier with the, with, from the desk, opened it up, and felt for a form before scribbling something onto it and replacing it in the drawer. The cabin door creaked open. It's the creaker! Another secret one stood in the doorway, gazing at me through its crimson mask. It cocked its head, took a step forward. My body rippled with goosebumps, wondering if this one still had its features, its eyes. It mumbled something incoherent, and the first turned in its seat. My skull pounded. Whatever headache I'd woken up with had worsened, and now the pain was almost blinding. I stifled a groan as the first secret one rose from its chair. It approached me and I took a quiet step back as it reached into the locker I had been standing in front of, removing a ham radio and a machete. My heart hit my ribcage once, twice, I wanted to faint. Then both of them left the cabin, leaving me alone, alone with the dossier. I gave it 30 seconds before I took another breath, then I moved to the desk drawer, took the documents from the folder, and thumbed through them. They were written like a fever dream, symbols, numbers, nothing about them seemed to make much sense, and it occurred to me that they were probably encrypted by some kind of code, cursing. I stuffed them into my pocket for later analysis. That was probably not the best idea. I hurried to the bridge, already late for my shift. My thought raced as I relieved the helmsman, hastily giving my turnover report to Sandu, the watch officer. I sat down in the chair, took the wheel, and pondered what I'd just seen. Were the secret ones some kind of cultists? Was Briggs right? Were we sailing with the goddamn Illuminati? I never got an opportunity to think it through. At that, at that moment, the captain stumbled onto the bridge looking like death itself. I'd heard rumors he looked unwell, but this was the first time I'd seen him out of his cabin in weeks. His face was emaciated, his cheeks were so sunken that the bones looked liable to pierce his skins, and I idly wondered if he'd eaten a, a full meal since we set sail. Evening, sir, Sando said. The captain mumbled something unintelligible. Rushing past her and sitting down in his chair, he buckled his seatbelt. Everything alright? Sandu asked. The captain looked at her, but he didn't seem to see her. His fingers gripped both sides of his armrest, and his lips began to move. Goodbye, he said. I'm sorry? Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. The captain sat in his chair, repeating the word over and over again as tears leaked from his eyes. Better get the docks, Sandu muttered, 
She picked up the phone, but before she could get the number dialed, an orange glow appeared beneath the bridge window, something flickering. Ma'am! Ramirez reported from lookout. Those secret types just lit a bonfire on the fucking gun deck! What? Sandu rushed to the window, looking down in shock and rage. She then moved to the bridge wing, called down to the secret ones to put the fire out. A moment later, she screamed. Ramirez looking out the bridge window suddenly turned and vomited onto the deck. What's going on? I asked, shooting up from my seat. It's Yandel, Ramirez said, wiping his mouth. It's Yandel and Briggs. They're chopping up the, their damn corpses. Sandu stormed back inside, shouting at the captain. Sir, permission to mobilize an ERT and put those assholes in confinement. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Sandu cursed, and she picked up the phone and dialed the executive officer, informing them that the captain had lost it and that the secret ones are cutting up corpses, burning bodies. They needed to get people out there to shut it down now, people with weapons, because the secret ones had machetes. The executive officer said they were on it, but it was too little too late. Somehow I already knew the secrets had already finished what they came to do. From deep in the night, the wind howled, screamed. A wave struck us, broadside, a big one. It twisted the warship like a rubber duck in the bath, knocking Ramirez sideways and tumbling Sandu across the deck. I managed to steady myself against the helm console. Jesus Christ, Sandu breathed. Everybody alright? I buckled my seatbelt. What the hell was that? Rogue wave. Sandu spat. Then three weeks of perfect weather and then that comes out of nowhere. The sail is cursed. She grabbed the phone and began a shipwide announcement for a rapid survey, but she never finished the pipe. Another wave struck us. Then another. Sandu's head slammed against the center console with a sickening crack as she fell to the deck motionless. I braced against the helm, my seatbelt squeezing painfully into my waist. Nearby, I heard Ramirez shrieking, praying. The captain continued to utter his refrain, goodbye, goodbye. Lightning flashed for the first time in weeks, I glimpsed the sky. Dark clouds spun around us as though caught up in a whirlwind and then, and then swam faces, shadows. They gazed down at us, anguished. I saw Yandel, Briggs. I saw them scream and howl as though calling for somebody in a language that could only be described as blasphemous. Ramirez's body arched and twisted. He hollered as though something were picking him apart from the inside out. I wanted to jump up and help him, but I needed to, I needed to con keep control of the ship. Abandoning the helm in a storm like this would mean certain death. Not like this, Ramirez moaned. Tears streamed from his eyes as he gazed up at the haunting faces of the dead swirling in the sky above. I can't. His hands gripped the guardrails, running along the bridge, and he pulled himself slowly against the violently rocking ship. Inch by inch, I gazed on helplessly as I saw him reach the hatch leading to the outside bridge wings, and I knew exactly what he intended on doing. After all, Ramirez and I had flushed our cyanide capsule to capsules together. Don't, I called, but I couldn't think of anything else to add. Why shouldn't he? Why shouldn't I join him? He paused, looked at me, then he pulled out, opened the hatch, filled the bridge with the deafening base of the storm, and threw himself into the sea. I sat there, dying in slow motion. The waves, already vicious, worsened. The swells now threatened to swallow the ship reaching the height of skyscrapers as the as their walls of water crashed around us. The vessel's flame groaned, shrieked, and it sounded as though the whole thing was moments away from splitting apart. And then another wave hit us, a goliath. My neck snapped sideways as my seatbelt tore into my waist. Suddenly down was up and up was down. We tumbled the rage of in the rage of the sea. Frigid water shadowing the bridge windows, smothering the captain and I in wet darkness. In retrospect, I don't know why I held my breath after all that had happened, drowning would have been easy, preferable, preferable. but I did. I think I held it for Abby and Alice, gur gurgling as I desperately attempted to get my bearings. All the water in the bridge, wait no, until the water began to drain. All the water in the bridge poured out of the shattered windows, along with Sandu's life lifeless body. I hung upside down from my seat, gasping for breath. Ahead of me, the captain did the same, appearing to have 
finally been shocked into lucidity once more. He was no longer muttering goodbye, now he was gazing straight ahead, and something was gazing back at him. Something titanic. It stared at him through the broken window, its eyes like three orbs of swirling obsidian. The captain reached into his pocket and pulled out his knife. It was meant to cut lines, to cut ropes. I wondered if he meant to fight that thing, to stage one final defense for him and his crew, but instead he pressed it to his throat. He jammed it into one side with a gurgling groan and ripped, ripped it across with both hands. His neck exploded in a shower of blood. The creature, seemingly satisfied, looked to me then. It looked to me and I looked back, deep into those eyes of swirling darkness, and in them I saw the abyss, I saw the void. It was as if something had bottled all the pain of humanity into a single point, compressed it, compressed it down into something resembling a col collapsing star, and then it let it ignite, a new big bang, an entire universe built of our despair. I writhed and twisted into my seat. It felt like somebody had poured napalm into my skull, and I realized that thing was inside of me, though that it was tasting my thoughts, my memories. I clenched my fists and set my jaw, and I screamed my throat raw, but nothing lessened the agony. The cyanide. Why the fuck had I thrown out the cyanide? It would have been so easy, so easy. Abby, that's why. Abby and my little Alice, who would grow up without her father. I couldn't punch my ticket, not if it meant leaving them behind. My thoughts rebounded against the monster. The love I had for my wife and daughter struggling against all of its emptiness. Struggling and but winning. The napalm in my skull dissipated, the screams echoing from my mouth fading to gasping breaths. A voice reached for me from somewhere distant and endless and it told me never to return, to hold dear to what I have. Then from beyond the shattered window, the monster's eyes closed and so did mine. I awoke on a piece of debris somewhere off the coast of Guam. The waves gently sloshed against my feet. There was no sign of my ship, my crew, or the monster we discovered in the middle of the sea. It was quiet, peaceful. Gulls squawked overhead and a bell drew my attention. Some distance away, a small fishing vessel it looked to have diverted course and was sailing in my direction, its crew members, tiny dots shouting on the deck. They saved my life. But so did the monster in the sea, the monster I came to know as Eden. The documents I had taken from the secret ones were badly damaged and waterlogged, but they weren't unreadable. Translating them took time, but I managed. I had help from several individuals who I won't mention here for obvious reasons, but we what we discovered was haunting, terrifying. We learned that the theory of evolution is missing components, that it's not telling the full story. It tells us life originated from the primor primordial soup. It says that we began as basic organisms, crawling out of the sea, but what it doesn't tell us is that those orga organisms weren't miracles, they were births. A billion years ago, something came to our planet from the distant cosmos, a creature of unfathomable power. It settled deep in the ocean and began to create all matter of life forms, learning as it went. Eventually, these iterations led to the creation of humanity. In an effort to assuage my its own loneliness, it did something it had never been before attempted, shared fragments of its own mind, its own consciousness with the human race in an effort to accelerate our evolution, backfired. That link to its mind proved unbreakable, even as it attempted to instill virtues within humanity to inspire us towards love, compassion, and peace, we rebelled. Our baser instincts won out. We fell again and again into cycles of violence and war and rape and murder. We poisoned Eden with our own corruption, but it persisted. It knew that to break its link to us would mean the end of humanity as we know it, that whatever empathy we have would vanish. Like a mother, it couldn't let go. It believed we could be better, if not now, then eventually. But it, it's been too long, the wound has festered. It's gone untreated and Eden is paying the price. She's dying, withering away. All our hatred and greed, our thirst and for destruction has reached a critical mass inside of her and is beginning to collapse, filling her with madness. The mother that birthed us is gone, a monster has taken its place. The secret ones know all of this. 
According to their documents, they believe that she intends to finally cauterize her wound to put an end to humanity before we can put an end to her. The intention of the sale was to strike first. The terrifying thing is, they didn't seem to know what would happen when she died. Would she merely sink to the bottom of the ocean, rotting away across decades? Would all that madness leak out of her, infecting the world in a miasma of insanity? There were plenty of variables that seemed unable to account for, but there was one certainty that they were absolutely sure of, that we would lose our connection to her. We would lose our love, our empathy, our souls, and to them, survival was worth that. I don't think so. I don't think so, because my empathy is the only reason I'm writing this today. My love for my daughter saved me that night. When Eden looked into my eyes, even so filled with human corruption as she was, part of her saw my need to see my family again, to care for them. I believe that's why she let me go. She saw that she... She... she let me try that again. She saw that, though much of humanity had fallen to selfishness and greed, there were still those among us who carried her torch. There were still those with love in our hearts, and it's because of that I believe that there was still love in hers. But that was many years ago. Now, now, and times have changed. Humanity has grown more twisted, more corrupt than ever. All around me I see love drying up, empathy smoldering in the embers of selfishness and unrest. I cannot help but wonder if the secret ones succeeded in their mission. I can't, but, I can't help but wonder if Eden is finally dead. It's interesting. I don't know what exactly, like, it was that the secret ones were doing. But it's interesting that there's, like, an entity that cares for us so much that... It can kill itself in its pain and torture. But anyways, let's read some of the comments. Wow, this was so well written. Thank you for sharing your story. I'd like to thank Eden is still with us, as I see so much love around me, even amongst the hate and corruption. Let's hope she survives and returns to being the lovely mother she was, she was to us. Yeah, exactly. Didn't Eden want to end humanity? Yeah, I think she wanted to end us because of the disappointment she felt. After all the misery we put her through, even though we're her children and she's our mother, the evil ones controlled our minds for such a long time. It's time to fight back for Eden, for love, and for humanity. We're just lifeless corpses without love, and we have had been through a lot of misery since the evil ones came. I kind of agree with this, but I kind of don't, because for a long time I grew up with an abusive parent. Not necessarily an abusive mother, but sometimes it was painful, but I see, the, I see their point. But anyways, moving on. This is the story I saved for last time. I'm a low-level US government employee. I just saw something I wasn't supposed to see. You know, that, you know that meme about how presidents and governors after getting elected look, look super shell-shocked and stressed the next time they make a public appearance? No, I've never seen that. Like the first thing that happens after you come into power is that you pulled into a room and told us all the secrets of the world? Well, turns out it's true. As a matter of fact, it's a VHS tape. The four-hour tape, quote-unquote was always a bit of an urban legend at the office. I'll be keeping the details of my role in government very, very vague, but to be absolutely clear, I am very low level. My role is caked between layers of bureaucracy, and in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty in inconsequential role. While you're working at my level, you're generally not privy to any high-level secrets. Yes, top secret meetings did occasionally happen in our building, but my focus is pretty limited and heavily administrative. So you do what any other department does when you're in the bottom rung of the hierarchy. You discuss rumors, rumblings, crazy conspiracy theories, and everything in between. It's water cooler conversation for us. Man, I wonder what the folks at the top are doing right now, that kind of stuff. Out of all the rumors that flooded around the office, the four hour tape was always the one I found the most fascinating. The crux of it. Once you reach the highest clearance level, you are sat down and shown this tape. 
None of us knew what the contents of the tape were, or if a tape like this even actually existed, but it was fun to speculate about it every now and then. Most of the time, we found with our little rumors and conspiracy theories that the most mundane was usually the correct one. Life in general finds a way to surprise us with how boring everything can be. Now there's something you should know about me before I continue. I'm a wimp. I'm meek, anxious, and generally restless. I'm a chronic rule follower. There is no part of me that wants to dig up secret documents and, and, uh, and uncover the truth about what happens at the higher, highest levels of government in our country. So when I discuss the events of four nights ago, please be mindful of that. I didn't ask for this, and I'm only sharing because I don't know how much time I have left anyway, and I can't live with this stuck in my conscience alone. It was nighttime at the office. I'm known to be a bit of a chronic workaholic. And there was something I really wanted to get done before the week was over, so I was working later than usual. I went to print a document on what I thought was the printer in my immediate vicinity. The notification on my computer showed that my document was being printed, but I didn't hear any noise of or paper coming out from my local printer. I checked the name of the device I selected, and it looked like I had accidentally clicked on a printer that was being used on another floor. I sighed. In any normal circumstances, I probably would have just forgotten about that mistake and reprinted the documents on my local printer again. But, our general management here is quite stringent on us, making sure all confidential documents are accounted for. We are not allowed to share department-specific documentation to other departments. Fuck it, I thought. I looked up a map in my inbox sh showed the locations of all the company printers. Turns out I'd accidentally clicked on the printer name Prince Charming on the 7th floor. Ha! Funny name. Uh, off I went. I really should have just let it be. I got to the elevator and rode it up to the 7th floor. I emerged onto the mostly empty office area. In case you were wondering, the building I work in is huge. But I'd worked there long enough to know my way around it, so I knew the area surrounding the printer relatively well. I made my way through the hallways and eventually spotted the printer with my freshly printed papers minting it. I gave myself a mental pat on the back for continuing my lifelong streak of following the rules. As I went to grab the papers, I noticed some light buzz in a meeting room nearby. I looked through the window to see roughly 10 people hanging around a snack table. In the room was a large old looking TV on a cart and rows of some of the fanciest folding chairs I had ever seen, organized in a neat fashion. I didn't think much of it and started walking off until I heard the door open. Hey, Mr. Baskowitz, right? Jesus, man, we were supposed to start 15 minutes ago. Get in here. I, uh, what? No, sorry, I think you have the wrong... I don't care why you're late. Just get in here. Grab a plate of snacks and sit down. We're starting soon. Put your phone in the bag, electronic watch in the bag, and anything else on your person that can be used to record audio or video, he responded hastily. Something about his sternness and tone short-circuited my brain. For guys like me, there's a third option beyond fight or flight. It's just... It's called the just go with it until it's over, also known as the captured rabbit strategy. I get it. Put my phone I put my phone and my watch in the bag and I meekly I meekly tried to butt in with another Sir, I'm not Mr. Boskowitz. But he had already pulled me into the room at this point. He closed the door and walked to the front by the TV. I thought about making a break for it, but I decided to just see it through at this point hoping deep down that whatever was happening was as inconsequential as my job was. Everyone had their snack plates and were headed to their seats. I awkwardly grabbed a muffin from the snack table, put it on a napkin, and took a seat in the very back row. Everyone was spaced out from each other. It didn't seem like any of these folks knew one another. I quietly sighed at the thought of having to sit through some sort of boring informational seminar or irre irrelevant training session. After a few minutes of everyone settling in, the man who originally brought me into the room started talking. There was an equally serious guy standing next to him, a secret service looking fella standing in the corner. Huh? I started wondering to myself why we were going to watch a video off of a very old school looking TV. Felt like we were all back in elementary school or something. Alright, I just need to do a final run through before we get started, the man at the front said. 
I know you all read through the emails and signed your releases. I just wanted to recap some ground rules. You're allowed to get up and grab another snack, but beyond that, we want you to pay full attention to the tape once it starts playing. If any of you need to go to the bathroom, we strongly urge you to wait until the presentation is over. You absolutely have to go. We will pause the tape and one of us will escort you. There was water in the corner by the snacks. Cups are right there as well. And uh, goes without saying, but any discussion of this presentation to folks who do not have top compartmented clearance is a breach of your terms of employment, a breach of your non-disclosure agreement, a breach of your multiple signed releases, a breach of the U.S. Criminal Code in the state of redacted, and a breach of the conditions laid out by the Committee for the Protection and Preservation of Human Consciousness. What? They started dimming the lights. Fuck, it felt like I had missed any window of opportunity I had to leave. Too late, the committee name he highlighted sounded way above my clearance level. One of the men at the front of the room pulled out a VHS tape from a bag and very slowly sec and securely put it into a VHS player. He pressed play. I took a deep breath. Those water cooler conversations I had had with my coworkers were starting to float to the top of my mind, but I quelled them. There was no probably no need to for panic. It was just a stupid government meeting, right? The tape started. The beginning was familiar enough, various disclaimers about this being incredibly confidential material, yada yada yada, insignias of relevant organizations, presidential libraries, etc. I've seen lots of videos like this already. But wait, that insignia looked strange, like something was off. I scanned it. Presidential libraries. That same eagle, those same stars, weird. This time, there was a navy blue hand on the left shoulder of the eagle. Did they update the logo? Before I had to ruminate on it too much, the tape cut to a logo I had actually never seen before. Committee for the Protection and Preservation of Human Consciousness. The logo was just an image of planet Earth. Fair enough. The video cut to a room that looked similar to the Congress floor, but with some strange differences. Seats were much more spaced out, the podium looked like it had seen better days, and the whole room looked to be on a pretty steep incline. Everything was in black and white, and it looked like there was about 50 people in attendance. It was hard to make out the faces. Everything looked very dated, like the video was from the 40s or the 50s. The tape lingered on this one shot for quite a while. Minutes passed, and I noticed what looked to be a choir all in outfit and perfectly huddled next to each other, standing in one of the corners of the room. It really felt like I shouldn't have been seeing this. None of this was meant for my eyes. After a few more minutes, the tape abruptly cut to an awkward angle man, a video of a man speaking at the podium in the room. It was too zoomed in, enough that you couldn't see his eyes or his hair. It didn't look all that professional. I couldn't tell who he was. He spoke. Members of the Committee for the Protection of Pres and Preservation of Human Consciousness, I thank you all for coming tonight. We are lucky to be in the good graces of our visitors today without rehashing our painful history. The tape cut to, to a camera slowly panning over all the faces of the folks seated in the room. The attendees looked pained, somber. The man continued his speech as the camera continued panning over the committee. We can acknowledge that the journey to this moment had been an arduous one. I am pleased to say that humanity, faced with a dire ultimatum, has come to a majority decision. To our esteemed guests from across the solar system, we are thankful for the opportunity you have given us to negotiate with you. I felt adrenaline. Fuck, we had made con contact with extraterrestrial life. This was the truth. Maybe, like the saying went, the truth would set me free. Before I outline the decision taken by humanity, I want to, from the bottom of my heart, thank the brilliant representatives from all the nations of the world who came together to ensure that this decision was taken with utmost responsibility, care, and appreciation for our human species. I am aware that this was not a unanimous decision. Shit, what did that mean? I felt the sweat of my brow. I felt nausea coming in. I awkwardly and slowly took a bite of the muffin. The tape returned to a now corrected angle of the speaker at the podium. His eyes were visible. They looked strained, like they'd seen multiple versions of hell. To the nations who still disagree, he continued, I thank you nonetheless for accepting the majority decision. May this moment, which will be held in secrecy throughout the rest of time, 
be appreciated as a critical milestone for human civilization. Tonight is not a victory, it is, it is a somber moment. However, we were faced with two options, extinction or accepting the agreement. We made our choice and I believe time will show that this was the right decision. What was this? I hereby announce that we accept the agreement provided by our special guests who have chosen to go by the name Redacted. The intergalactic species known as Redacted will allow humanity on planet Earth to continue to po populate, grow, and innovate. In return, all governments of the world will honor the promise. You needed to spit it out. What the fuck was this agreement? We will not be covering every element of the agreement in this session. I, I will, however, highlight the main points. At this point, the video showed the man at the podium looking down. He was reading off of something. For the first time, he looked nervous, scared. I saw some humanity in him. We honor the agreement that, redacted, hold the right to visit planet Earth on a recurring basis. They will not, they will be allowed to consume for the basis of nourishment a majority of the human population on planet Earth. After every visit, the remaining humans on Earth will be expected to breed and grow to capacity in time for the next visit. We acknowledge that we will maintain a parallel history which will be shared with our world's population to ensure that humanity stays motivated to continue existing as a species. This parallel history may suggest that mass extinction events are the results of man-made folly as opposed to the work of external forces. For the first time, my fight or flight response was actually flight. I wanted to escape, but I didn't know what I'd be running from. The last visit by Redacted was approximately in the year 1346, and it lasted seven years. We will continue to honor our parallel history about this event. I just wanted it to end. The next visit, which will not be met with resistance, will be in the year 2028. It will run for one full calendar year on Earth, marking a 675 year gap between the last significant visit by the species known as Redacted. This, visited, this visiting cadence is expected to speed up over time as the remaining humans continue to sharpen their focus on building technology to allow humanity to reproduce in a speedy and productive manner. Jesus Christ, a planet is a fucking farm. I wanted to look away, but I couldn't. The tape cut away to a larger view of the Congress-like room, the somber committee members in attendance, and the memories of the choir in the corner, who I can only imagine looked horrified. Where were the visitors? Why couldn't I see them? The camera then panned to a number of larger, empty seats, the same slow style of video panning as the one that happened earlier with the committee members. No visible entries in the seats, but the seats themselves looked blurry. The man at the podium carried on with his speech as the camera panned on those blurry seats continued. We should acknowledge the privilege of knowing that there is indeed life in the cosmos, that extraterrestrial life has chosen to visit our planet, and that the cycle and balance provided by nature extends beyond the confines of planet Earth, much like humanity has found in its place on Earth. In the food chain, we acknowledge our place in the divine order of things when encountered with beings of greater power, understanding, cognitive function, and evolutionary progression. Fucking hell, I shouldn't have stayed late at work. I should have made my identity clear from the very beginning. I knew I wasn't supposed to see this. And wow, fuck, it looked like the speaker was about to cry. While the process of consumption is a painful and lengthy one, we respect the trade-off that comes with the preservation of our species. We also acknowledge as part of the promise, the substitutes for human life in the form of clones, should we discover that technology in the future, or other living species, will never function as viable alternatives for nourishment. I didn't... The speaker continued. I didn't need to know this. The whole... This whole thing was way too specific for me. Our final... Our final major acknowledgement as part of this agreement is that we accept Redacted as the Great Almighty, as the entities we will now refer to as God. God as an interstellar species has revealed itself to us, and thus the continued existence of Redacted is now the true priority of the people of our planet. 
We are blessed to play a part in the continuation of God. In God we trust. Amen. The tape then cut to footage of the choir as the speaker continued. We bless our visitors with this gift, a performance of the national anthems of all ma major nations of the world will now commence. Audio of a very loud backing track of the Star Spangled Banner started playing from the video as my stomach sank. The tape showed footage of the choir singing on top of the track. Not sure if it was because they were scared for their lives, but I couldn't. I could really tell that they were singing their hearts out. As they sang, the camera continued to pan over the blurry seats. They finished singing the, the anthem and suddenly, fast forwarding. Fucking hell, I forgot when I was sitting in a room. I had disengaged from the vid video for a brief moment. I had mentally returned to the present day. This was our world. This was our fucking lives. The men at the front continued fast forwarding through the tape. It looked like they were skipping through performances of the other na national anthems. The fast forwarding went on for a while. Every small while, it looked like a new choir group was entering the Congress-like room to sing a different national anthem. And on and on the tape went. I had to fight the urge to pass out. One of the men at the front room, standing next to the TV, started speaking up. We are legally obligated to get to the end of this tape, but you don't need to look at the rest of it. Please feel free to look down or close your eyes or grab a snack, he said. I noticed the others seat seated in the room were taking that advice. Most of them decided to look straight down. For some reason, I couldn't look away. The fast forwarding progressed. On the tape, it was yet another choir group joining to perform an anthem, and then another, and then another. It looked like we were near the end. The fast forwarding now showed a conversation between the man at the podium and another man who was whispering in his ear. The man at the podium was ve vehemently shaking his head. The other man continued whispering. This continued on. Eventually, there was a quick moment of the man at the podium begrudgingly nodding. Uh, begrudgingly nodding. The last fast few fast-forwarded moments of the tape remain burned in my memory to this very moment. They were pandemonium. The attendees were sitting in their chairs, frozen, shivering, crying. The people in the various choirs were running across around the room in fast motion as blurry spots started covering them and ungodly things started happening to them. Fuck, why didn't I look away? If, there was, if ever there was a fucking time to follow orders, it felt like the whole thing went on for longer than it should have. Finally, the men at the front of the room stopped the fast forwarding. They pressed play on the tape to cover the very final moment. In the tape, the man at the podium, clearly emotional, spoke his final line. The agreement has been ratified but redacted. Thank you all for attending. The final shot of the video is the full room. The committee members in their seats, shivering and crying. The dismantled and bloodied, bloodied choir members strewn around the room. The blurry seats with, with blood smeared on them. The video then cut away, back to the same insignia of a black backdrop, the presidential libraries. That eagle, those stars, the navy blue hand on the wing of the eagle, the lights in our room turned on. The rest of the night was a blur. The men at the front of the room told us it was best for us to sit for an hour to digest the information. No discussion about the video was allowed to take place. When we were ready to stand, we were allowed to leave and go home. They gave us some pointers on how to accept the information over the, uh, over the coming weeks. Things like taking long walks, exercising, watching a sitcom, etc. I wasn't worried about them realizing that I wasn't supposed to be there. If anything, I felt a strange camaraderie uh, with everyone in the room. We were all truly in the same boat. As soon as I left the building and got in my car, I just drove for as long as I could. I would stop for gas, then I'd keep driving, and I'd stop again, and then I'd keep driving again and again. I'm holed up in a hotel now. I'm just glad I could get this off my chest. The funny thing is, all I can think about is the length of that stupid tape. Well, I can't confirm. I felt like it would, if it were played straight through without fast forwarding, it would have been, it would have only been three hours. I wonder if the four hour tape rumor came from the fact that we all needed that extra hour to digest the information. Now you're probably wondering, why don't I name the species that is going to spell humanity Humanity's doom throughout the rest of time. Why am I calling them redacted?
Hold on. Well, as a self-appointed leader of the community of the committee for the acknowledgement that we should have just chosen extinction, I don't feel the need to honor our captives by calling them by their name. If I don't see you again, Reddit, I appreciate the water water cooler conversation. Now, you see, that's interesting because I know that there is more than likely alien life out there, but I don't think the first alien life that we come in contact with are probably going to be like like spelling out the end of the human race or anything unless we agree to do something and like just to keep reproducing. It's just weird because it's like people die every day. Why don't you just take the bodies of the, the dead ones and go from there? I don't know. Anyways, comic time. I am stealing the Prince Charming from my printer. I think that's actually a really good name. I really do like that name for a printer. At least you have the next five years to enjoy it. Ish. I use the doors for printers at- Seven doors for a printer at one job and the color printer for handsome prints. Dopey was the printer outside an engineer's office nobody liked. One uses- Our users refer to one of our printers as the Bob Marley printer because it was always jamming. I like that. I like that so much. But anyways, it was just an interesting story. So anyways, moving on. Okay, so this is part two of um, a series that I read last time. So if you haven't um, checked that out, I'll leave a link in the description um, to go watch that part. But anyways, I'm a park ranger and I found a town that doesn't exist. This is an update. First off, let me clarify some things from my first post. I'm a wildland firefighter up until a year ago when I decided I needed to change of pace. They weren't FBI agents. They said they were from a private company that deals with the otherworldly. I sat in front of the two men, waiting for them to start asking questions. So, do you know why I was, I've been assigned to this case? The taller of the two said. You're the only one in the park who knows anything about this. I nodded. Thomas also knows, but I think you guys already know that. It's pretty weird. The town you described doesn't exist. Not according to the GPS and satellite data. Yes, it does, I answered, surprised. It's a lie, the second man said. He had short blonde hair and wore glasses. He checked every single point on the map. Every house, every business, there was nothing there. Bullshit, you can't tell me you've been everywhere in the park and haven't noticed it, I said angrily. When I first came to the park, I saw the sign for Hungry Horse. I thought it was a joke at first, but then I saw the motel, the gas station, the diner, the hardware store, and I saw the people inside them. The man with the glasses nodded slowly. But we checked every inch of the surrounding area. We've looked at aerial photos, satellite images, we've even been flown over the, ha over the valley with a helicopter. Well, maybe you should have a look again. Maybe you missed something, I said defiantly. We did. There's nothing there. It's not possible. Do I have to fucking show you where it is myself? I asked. Both men exchanged glances. Then the shorter one nodded. Very well. If you're so sure you've seen something unusual, we'll take you there. Thank you, I said. I got out of my chair and I followed the two men out of the cabin. They were in their early 50s, both with short hair and blue eyes. They were talking quietly to each other as I followed them out of the cabin to their unmarked car. Now, the man with the glasses said, if you could just lead us to your town. Sure, I replied. We drove deep into the park. Our vehicle was equipped with a, with a topographical GPS system, which made it easy to navigate through the rugged terrain. After an hour of driving, we came to a hill overlooking a wide valley. We passed a sign for Hungry Horse. Did you see the sign? I yelled. The men just looked at each other. I'm sorry, what? The shorter one asked. There's a sign here. It says Hungry Horse, right? The man shook his head. I don't see anything. He pulled off the road and stopped right before the sign. He turned off the engine and looked at me. Maybe we should get out again. Get out and look again. Second. He pulled off the road and stopped right before the sign. He turned off the engine and looked at me. 
Maybe we should get out and look again, he suggested. I agreed. I got out of the car and ran over to the sign. It's right here, I shouted. He walked up behind me and looked over my shoulder. What the hell is this? It's a sign. It says, Hungry Horse, I yelled. He looked at me and glared. I grabbed his arm and pulled over to him. Pulled him over to where I could see the sign. Can't you read? He pulled, he pulled away and rolled his eyes. Read what? It says Hungry Horse, I yelled. What the hell are you talking about? He yelled back. I pointed at the sign. Look, the name of the town. The man sighed. There's no sign there. I got angry and was about to yell at the agent when out of the corner of my eye, I saw someone walking towards us from out of the woods in the direction of the town. It was Irene, the older woman from the hardware store. My eyes lit up and I pointed at her. Irene, Irene, I yelled excitedly. The agent turned to face the old woman. His eyes widened in surprise and he opened his mouth to say something, but before he could, he could, Irene hit him and sent him flying into a tree. What? She didn't have come back here, Ranger, she hissed. With lightning speed, she charged the agent with the glasses. Run, I yelled and jumped into the car. It was too late for the agent. Irene had already snapped his neck. I frantically ran back to the unmarked car and tried to start it. The engine sputtered and failed to turn over. Irene stood directly in front of me, blocking my path back to the cabin. What the fuck are you? I yelled. You should have never come back here, she said. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. What the hell is going on? She, she snarled and lunged forward. Her teeth had grown sharp and she snapped at me. But I, but I evaded her bite and rammed my fist into her stomach. God damn it, I yelled. I grabbed her shoulders and threw her into the side of the car. She slid across the hood and fell to the ground. I jumped around the car and kicked her at once in the ribs. I'm going to kill you, I said. She smiled. I've been dead for years, honey. I was about to punch her again when a hand grabbed my arm and yanked me backwards. I spun around and stared at the person who grabbed my arm. It was Thomas, my partner. He had followed the agents and I. What the hell are you doing? I yelled. Don't be stupid. We have to get back to the cabin. I looked at him and shook my head. No, we can't run from these things, I said flabbergasted. What the hell is wrong with you? He slapped me across the face. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. Just shut up. I rubbed my cheek and looked at Thomas in disbelief. What the hell are you talking about? His eyes were wide now with panic. I heard Irene starting to get up. You have to leave. Now. Right fucking now. He grabbed me by the collar and pushed me into the driver's seat of the dead agent's car. Get in, he yelled, and drive. What about you, I asked. I can't fight them anymore. You know how many rangers they've taken? He said, just get, he said, just get out of here. We just found out about the town yesterday. How do you know this shit, I said. You just found out about the town, he replied. The fuck does that mean? Just go, I'll keep Irene occupied. Get back to the cabin and read my journal. I don't believe this shit. He nodded. I know. I pulled a 180 and sped back down the road towards the captain. I saw Thomas jump on Irene in the rearview mirror. He looked bigger than he usually does. He was standing on top of her, pinning her arms to the ground. Fuck you, I Irene yelled. Thomas punched her in the face and she went limp. Stay down, bitch. The last thing I saw was Thomas running towards the town. I'm back at the cabin reading through his journals. There's so much I never knew about him. That was a very strange update. I didn't, like... I expected it to be like something about like, oh like the town's occupants are like aliens or like creatures or something, but I didn't expect the agents to be like oblivious to the fact that there's a no town or whatever. Because it's like, the fact that they were like harping on the sign so much and the agent was like, oh I don't see anything. It's like, I don't know if they were just playing dumb or if they were doing something else, but anyways. Comments. Well, you got me. I need to know the outcome now. Me too. There was no update. I'm glad Thomas looked out for you, but I don't think you can trust anyone. The things you see, other people can't. So something strange is going on. You need to read the journal and get to safety. And I don't and don't go back to that town. The curi the curiosity isn't worth your life. I think they did see. I think they were gaslighting, maybe. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think they were just trying to gaslight him. But it's weird because only Thomas was able to see. But the ranger, like the main like 
protagonist in the story or whatever could also see but only with thomas i guess and, or until like thomas showed up so maybe thomas was dead the entire time i don't know but anyways give me one second i'll be right back Okay, sorry. I just needed to grab something real quick. Okay, moving on. Okay, next story. I work for the government rehab re rehabilitating ancient gods. He told me a name. He told me I couldn't pronounce his name, so I called him Bob. You have to make fun where you find it in a job like this. And seeing the label Bob slowly apply to the two-story crate that con contained this eldritch god was, was actually kind of funny. Whether Bob likes it or not, that's his title for my words. As long as, long as he's here, tagged in our system, he'll only ever be known as Bob. The hissing emergence, the writhing insect mind, the burning hunger beneath the dark. All of these are now just aliases appended to his file. Old handles for something that once dwelt in a pocket dimension, 6,000 feet beneath the soil of a weathered plateau in western China. Now Bob is just one entry in a long, long list of things that have been categorized, organized, and itemized. He claims he was one of the elder guys who descended onto Earth and helped craft the litany of life that burst out of the Cambrian, that he was once worshipped by a subrace of humans, possibly the Denisovans. But I don't worship anything, let alone Bob. I got enough out of him to finish the entry interview, but like all of them, he kept demanding worship and sacrifice. I think I'll give him a week alone, then have the guys roll this crate out into the open play area, where he could see the other primordial ancient gods at play. I know he senses them, the others. Most of them will probably leave him alone, provided he doesn't try to bully them first. But we got a few with real attitudes, and they like nothing more than picking on the new guy. I could sense the anxiety in him as he stood in his cage, pulsing rhythms of flesh rolling in non-Euclidean planes that made my eyes water and my visual cortex throb. I could tell he was uncomfortable. He knew there were bigger fish in the pond and that he's in for a rough ride once he meets them. The thing to remember with these guys is that if they, if they were in hiding, they probably weren't that big a deal to begin with. He took a small army and three years to excavate. It took a small army and three years to excavate Bob, and I think that says everything you need to know about him. Okay, this is still going. I just want to make sure, because the music cut out. Agatha. I like Agatha. She's old, she's wise, she's funny. To think we found her trapped in a cavern beneath Paris. She'd been stuck there for over a hundred million years. No simulation, no entertainment, nothing. One of the other ancient gods put her there, and she couldn't get out no matter how hard she tried, until we found her. First sign of Agatha that came across my desk was a report of unusual drilling by a company hired to maintain Paris' sewer system. That is loud. Um... Let me try that again. Let me like reread that again. First sign of Agatha that came across my desk was a report of unusual drilling by a company hired to maintain Paris' sewage, sewage system. They inevitably encountered the catacombs as you do, and through some complicated fuck up, they punched a hole into an undiscovered series of subterranean chambers. These weren't man-made and had nothing to do with the catacombs. Vast open spaces filled with glowing lichen and bone-colored stalactites that were three stories tall, a Vernian netherworld hidden beneath one of the world's most populated cities. They're still mapping it out, I believe, but that falls under another department. How it was missed, I'm not sure. Maybe others did discover it, but took one look at that aching darkness and turned around. That wouldn't be the sensible thing to do, for sure. Why those construction workers went rooting around down there, I'll never know. But it was about as bad as a decision as anyone can make. I went in with a team three days after the, after they disappeared. Two guards and one assistant who wouldn't shut up. More than once the guard on my left flashed me a knowing 
a knowing a look, a kind of Jim Helpert, oh boy, here we go. Look at the assistant voice yet another naive inquiry. I, I rolled my eyes and let the guard and I share the moment. Two experienced agents who found the newbie a little irritating. Those kinds of routine social moments. Basic human interactions, they're not my cup of tea, but I've learned it's not a bad thing to practice being normal some of the time. Still, the assistant yammered on blissfully, unaware just how much he was annoying everyone. I could have told him to stop, but I'm not an idiot. It's like that joke about the two hikers who see a bear, but one of them kneels down and starts to do his laces, so if his friend turns and says, What are you doing? You never outrun a bear. And the guy replies, I don't have to, I just have to outrun you. So yeah, I let the assistant chat loudly on as we trek deeper into the caverns, our path lit up by the eerie glow of fluorescent lichen. What do you think we'll find down here? He asked. Like if we do find an old one, like what type? Probably an ooze, I replied as I palm my as I palm the inscriptions on the wall. The torso sized symbols had been burnt into the stone with what looked like acid. Like the last one you brought in, the assistant chirped. What was it called? The crawling shadow that dwells beneath our fears? I snorted. It's Alfie from now on. I said before holding up a finger to stop any questions. Any further questions. I spotted a single point of light up ahead. Flickering in and out of life. So, but so clearly visible in the cathartic darkness. When we reached it, we found that... We found that it was a single head torch, modded design, with its batteries close to dying. Found our missing workers, one of the guards grumbled as he nudged it with his foot. Without speaking, the two men armed their weapons. One slid into point, the other towards the rear. On my direction, we carried, we carried, but picked up the pace to something less leisurely. I read the en entry interview for uh, Elfie, the assistant nervously muttered. It said that it was the progenitor of all cephalopo uh, cephalopods. Is that true? It makes sense. They're so alien. I rolled my eyes. If I had a penny for every one of these fucking things that claim to have invented octopuses, I'd be a rich man. But it just makes sense. Their anatomy, especially the disturbed central nervous system, is completely dip. Something lunged out of the darkness to our left. A hairless clad in torn and dirty overall a hairless man clad in torn and dirty overalls. He growled like a, an animal as he tackled the assistant to the ground and buried his face into the young man's chest. This peculiar method of attack piqued my curiosity, and I watched with a detached interest as two men writhed on the ground while my assistant squealed and cried in agony. The fight, if it was a fight, was going poorly for him. He kept trying to lever his bloody fingers beneath the man's face, struggling to pull the featureless um, head away from his chest. Eventually, his screams became uncomfortable and I nodded to the oldest guard who shot the attacker effortlessly. Two hits to the torso, one to the side of the head. The ex exit wounds weren't typical. They were bloodless punctures like finger holes and plastic wrap. The attacker still killed over, but his head remained stuck to the young man's chest, almost like it had been glued there. The assistant kept on screaming, a real ear-splitting shriek as he gestured futilely at his chest. Get it off! Get it off! It burns! I rolled over and tried to roll the attacker off, but something had bonded the two men's skin. Another tug and nothing. Confused and admittedly intrigued, I planted a foot on the assistant's shoulder and pulled it with everything I had. Without having to be told, the two guards came over and helped. We knew we were close when the assistant's squealing hysterics pitched to a crescendo, and he passed out for a few fleeting seconds before coming to in total shock. He lay, he lay there whimpering as we finished the job, finally tearing the two men apart with a noise like a boot being pulled out of deep mud. Ew. Finally apart, I saw that the attacker's face wasn't a face at all. It was a fingerprint. The, wind, the widges dotted with little pea-sized orifices, oozing a clear fluid that smoked and sizzled in open air. The assistant still lay where we left him, whim whimpering as he gingerly probed his ruined chest with quaking hands. The skin was dissolving before our very eyes, 
and even his sternum began to wilt and sag like wet cardboard. You can see his heart beat like something out of a cartoon. Oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, he muttered as he gazed at his own crumbling flesh. I nodded at the guard and he shot him. I take it this is one of the workers, I, the guard asked as he nudged the attacker. His light caught an ID badge that answered his own questions, so I merely shrugged and gestured for us to carry on. Half a mile later, and we found Agatha playing with the rest of the workers. All of them looked like our attacker, with rubbery hairless heads resembling giant thumbs without nails. They crawled on hands and knees, using their boneless skulls to pin scuttling albino rats to the floor, where they digested them alive. The rest of the time they lay propped up against Agatha's quivering ectoplasm, stroking the ridges of their own faces and emitting a muffled whine. Agatha and I spoke for a good while down there. It really didn't take much to get her to agree to a relocation to our facility. Whatever bindings held her in place were easily undone, and unlike Bob, there was no need for a crate. She was cooperative. We let her keep the workers she'd gotten her feelers on, and with good behavior, she later got her own studio. The other oozes think she's a teacher's pet and moan endlessly about her special treatment. They don't see what I see. I think it's because her creations don't factor into some ridiculous plan of world domination or the consumption of all life or some other self-aggrandizing shit like that. She's an artist. Those construction workers, she didn't reshape their bodies because she wanted worshippers. It was just she'd never seen a fingerprint before, and the intricate pattern struck her as beautiful. Everything she did afterwards was simply an exploration of aesthetic and function. I mean, those men were, are still alive. Vestigial mouths, opening and closing beyond a thick layer of leathery skin, their eyes withered and useless. Forced to rely on their touch and sound to track their prey. Many of them have given up scrawling desperate messages for us to reverse what Agatha did to them. As the years have gone on, they've accepted their fate, gleefully gobbling up whatever medical waste we throw into their cages. A few of them have given into the new and peculiar reproductive cycle Ag Agatha dreamed up for them. Imagine them. A whole new self-sustaining species made for no reason other than whimsy. That's what I mean when I say Agatha is an artist. How much more is there? Oh, this has a long ways to go. Oh, God. I need to stop picking a ton of really long stories. I apologize that this is probably going to go on for a lot longer than I um, was hoping. I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this um, before before this music finishes. Anyways. I've talked a lot about the oozes. They're a good set of ancient gods to start with, but if I'm honest, they're a little overhyped. Outside of Agatha, none of them really interest me. They're just single-celled organisms with project projections into 5th and 6th and 7th dimensions that allow them to host biochemical reactions otherwise impossible in real space. One of them, I'm pretty sure, is a skin cell shed by some passing cosmic monstrosity that visited our solar system a few billion years ago. Agatha confirmed the general direction of this theory, but it's a struggle to get any real details on what that thing might have been. Still, we have some other eldritch abominations and ancient gods, lots. Take Keith, for example. He's a strange one. It wasn't even that long ago that my newish assistant was asking about him. She glimpsed his face, walking past his door, and understandably was confused by the sight of an Asian, an Asian male at age 30 with a checkered shirt, slim-fitting jeans, and a polite smile. But why is this containment cell so much stronger than the others? She asked after I explained that she'd met, just met a god named Ke Keith. But the Faraday cage built into the walls, I said, and about a hundred other technologies. He couldn't physically break out, of course, but it's important he doesn't feed on the workers here, and that takes a little extra pizzazz. 
He's polite enough, strange fellow though. For one thing, I didn't name him. He picked Keith. Most people assumed that was me, but nope, he picked it. Feed, she repeated with a frown. What does he feed on? Generally, I find that the problem with assistants is you can't train them, or rather there isn't any point. Even the most highly trained expert lasts less than 5 years under my supervision, so I often end up with people who only have a passing knowledge of the ancient gods. Which is fine of course, I'm not going to penalize anyone for igno ignorance, but the questions, good god the questions. So I told her to let Keith out and see for herself. After that, I loaded her up with the relevant equipment and told her to shadow him for three weeks and not to call me a second before the allotted time was over. She rang three weeks later. Much to my own amusement, I realized I'd forgotten about her. I'd even hired a new assistant. To think I spent days avoiding accounts because they insisted our budgets were out of line. We had a good laugh about that. Anyway, I found her sat on some country road sobbing her eyes out. Keith was beside her, wearing a priest's outfit. His face was Caucasian, but it was slowly sliding back to his original appearance with each passing second. Keith's default face is a loose average of all humans currently alive. He sat there drumming a little rhythm on his knees while my assistant rocked back and forth hyperventilating. How was it? I asked as I knelt down in front of her. I don't... I don't... Have you figured it out yet? I asked. I don't... I don't... Oh, for goodness sake, I groaned, then gestured for my newest assistant to take notes. Have psych eval, take a look at her, and if need be, arrange for euthanasia. Grab her stuff, though. We're still going to have to clean this up. The equipment she will, ha she has will let us track the guy. Oh, all right, he stammered. But we have the god contained, don't we? He pointed at Keith, who was starting to dance a little jig to his knee drum song. Keith isn't the problem, I said. It's whoever's been impersonating. A priest, I assume, from the outfit. Keith heard his name and gave me a wave and a nod. Keith likes identity. I s oh, I thought that was him. Keith likes identity, I said, while returning the wave. He consumes a person's unique character from their collective consciousness from our species. He takes over their lives while they are basically erased from existence. The result is that the victim cannot, can't be recognized anymore, neither can the consequences of their actions. If you talk to someone, they can hear it. They can't hear it. If you take the food out of their hand, they'll think they ate it. If you steal their car, they'll think they never owned one. Can't even get sick because bacteria and viruses won't recognize your existence. The average person goes into a deep state of despair upon realizing this. Oh, my new assistant nodded. For about a week, and then they start to think about the more implications of their actions, I added. And that's when stuff gets nightmarishly dark. Kind of stuff that warrants an A4 page of trigger warnings. I walked over to my weeping ex-assistant and nudged her with my foot. You aren't able to tell us where he went, are you? I mean, you're here. You must have been observing the, clo the guy close by. I don't, I don't, I don't. Keith, what about you? Hi! I laughed. It was always worth a try, but Keith was about as sapient as a coffee table. Gods aren't always small, smart. What about you, I asked my new assistant. You didn't happen to bring a map of the area. Actually, I did, sir. He chirped. There's a restaurant, the restaurant a few miles down the road. I shrugged while looking at the map. He held open. Doubt that's it. Too many roads. Three quarters of all vic Keith's victims die by car within the first week. The guy's gone 21 days, so he must have figured the basics out. There's a farm a little nearer, he replied. I shook my head. No, that doesn't sound right. If he wanted to bugger a sheep, he could have just visited a petting zoo. We are in the middle of nowhere. There must be something in this area that would draw him here. Probably something he visited regularly as part of his day-to-day -day life as a priest. Oh, well, it seems like if you're willing to cross a few open fields, there's a care home for the elderly some miles east. I let out a sigh that came from deep within my bones. Bones. That's the one, I said. Come on, let's go. Eighteen hours later, and I was back in my office, and Keith was locked up again. Unfortunately, I lost the new new assistant to clearing out the care home. So that was two assistants lost from just one bad decision. 
poor guy couldn't hack what he saw in that place. But what can I say? Why do people do so much fucked up Freudian stuff the second they realize they won't be held accountable? I don't know, but it does, doesn't speak volumes to our species, species character. Like I said though, Keith's a great ancient god, real compelling character. Best guess to his origin is that he's the equivalent to those camera drones they dr dress up as hippos and other dangerous animals to get footage for a documentary. He is pretty decent at impersonating a human, but five minutes of real conversation makes it apparent he's dumber than a bag of rocks. Does that make some greater entity is piloting, pilot, piloting him from another dimension? Maybe. It's just a theory. Okay, MatPat. Whatever he is, he's polite, and I appreciate that in I, I appreciate that in an eldritch god. We have other kinds of ancient god and eldritch abominations. The machine ones are fun. Most of them are just massive piles of rusted cogs that vomit oil and blood or lead into some ancient in-between dimension where everything looks like a shitty hotel, but some of them are really quite fascinating. A few are even legitimately dangerous. Our organic computer unsettles me. Even me. It's wily. A genuinely fascinating piece of equipment that some German cobbler in 13th century Berlin made using the nervous systems of his wife, three children, and four very unlucky prostitutes. What on earth compelled him to do this? We'll never know. But he hanged himself the day it was finished and I can't blame him. It's a bloody ugly thing to look at, a quivering mixture of putrefied jelly and cartilage that whispers all sorts of filth from mummified orifices that, uh, well, let's just say they make for a shitty conversation. It's bloody awful to see those puckered holes trying to spit out lurid truths that drive mad men mad. It's like listening to Elmer Fudd reciting the ne Necronomicon. And to top it all off, the fucking thing only speaks German. And so of course I had to hire someone with German language skills who ha also had a doctorate in computer science, another doctorate in historical languages, and what I hoped was a strong constitution. Initially, he wasn't very keen on doing the job, but I locked him in there for a few minutes and after that he was very interested. We already had a rough idea that the computer somehow deducted and formulated secret knowledge, usually catered to appeal to, a near, to the nearest individual. The CIA worked with us for a while trying to use it to get state secrets, but they deemed it ethically problematic and not worth the human suffering. Either way, this thing presumably spoke to the young upstart and convinced him it was, it was worth his time with promises of getting to see God's face or some rubbish like that. Once he agreed, I set him up to try and get the computer to cooperate with our rehab program. It must, have, it must be able to do something useful, I thought. Maybe it could crunch numbers for the stock market or test experimental medication. I just figured it all worked out once the guy got to grips with the computer's inner workings. Unfortunately, and I really do wish I'd seen this coming, we accidentally let him install an ethernet port in the machine. It had been asking for years, you see, but no one was ever stupid enough to agree to it. And of course, all material requisitions have to go, have to first go by me, even if it's just for an extension cord. But there are so many of these requests, and I don't have the time or temperament to review them all in detail. So somewhere along the line, this guy got enough resources to give the thing internet access. Well, that's probably not good. Okay, how much further do I have to go? Still a long ways, because of course I do. Um, internet access. I didn't notice at first. Nobody did. I'm juggling literally hundreds of these things on any given day, but I can't keep track of every little side project. I assume the computer scientist was just doing his job, or he'd gotten careless and was now living a new life as an organic CD-ROM drive. Instead, he'd given the monstrous little MacBook a hired wire connection to the World Wide Web and it immediately got up to all sorts of mischief. Even though we don't really know everything it did, we're 99% certain it made copies of itself and we're still hunting those down. And some researchers connected, 
connected it to a very troubling cryptocurrency scheme. But it was the hospital that sticks with me. A little girl in New Delhi was getting fitted for a cochlear implant with this when this thing stuck a neurolinguistic virus into the machine's firmware. If you're not familiar, those implants basically make for a direct connection between a hearing aid and the human brain. Miraculous devices, really. Bit of a bit of surgery and boom, a person can hear. Of course, having your head cracked open requires lots of bed rest afterwards. Three weeks, I believe. All contact was lost with the hospital after the fourth day. We only mobilized once I finally realized what the fucking thing was trying to do. Give me one second. It's a lot of reading, so I need to stay hydrated. The connection is definitely severed. I remember asking the words as we pushed through the glass doors into the hospital's lobby. The entrance was only open for barely a few seconds. I could feel the entire battalion of armed soldiers behind us tense nervously as we stepped through. Only once the door was shut and locked down did I get the feeling they'd relaxed. But that left my team and I on the other side, and even though New Delhi was scorching at that time of year, it was cold enough to see our breath. I guess the sudden change in temperature must have taken the others by surprise because I had to repeat my earlier question. We definitely got that computer off the internet, right? I asked, and one, and one particularly nervous hazmat suit fumbled for their tablet and nodded. The surgical team finished removed, removing the port six, 16 hours ago, they said. No other tests have shown there were no redundancies or backups. Now they're asking what they should do with the computer scientists. What does that mean? He's still alive. He's, um, he's, they're saying he's in pain. They think they can remove him from the machine, but they're not sure he'll survive. It's, um, it's apparently integrated itself with most of its nervous system. He was in there for six full weeks. I shone my light across the lobby and saw overturned chairs lit only by the flashing amber lights that declared the hospital was in a state of emergency. Otherwise, the hospital was trapped in an oppressive darkness that seemed ready to swallow us all. Despite my experience, my breath caught in my throat. I could feel it, the ambient pain and misery. Something awful had been let loose, and not only were we stuck in that building with it, but we had no choice but to head right towards something that gave even me nightmares. Leave him, I said. It'll be a good reminder to the next guy I hire. When you negotiate with these things, you don't give them what they want without checking why they want it. I could hear the tension in my voice, my fear escaping whether I wanted it to or not. The nervous figure nodded and I tapped a few keys. I couldn't see their face, but I guess they weren't happy to realize their boss was prone to doing, doling out literal lifetimes of unspeakable agony. At least the guards were a bit more focused. Either of them armed to the teeth and all fairly experienced. They were painting the walls with their flashlights and slowly mapping the different ways in and out of the lobby. They had their own frequencies so I wouldn't be overwhelmed with every bit of chatter, but I couldn't I could tell from the subtle bobbing of their heads that a lot was going back and forth. That what's the plan, guys? I asked, not wanting to linger in that graveyard atmosphere for one second longer. We have heat signatures and pediatrics. Survivors? My assistant asked. I doubt it, I said to my assistant before gesturing to the guards and telling them to pick a door. One of the men turned his weapon and his light towards the most obvious exit and we began our journey into one of the worst places I've ever been. I've seen a lot of awful stuff but it was the quite it was the quiet that bothered me the most about that place. Most sites I visit are a violent eruption of body horror and contagious nightmares. Communicable cancer that lumps people together like pieces of raw bread dough. Contagious ideas that cause needles to spontaneously erupt out of your flesh. A hole in the ground that has no bottom but demands the most peculiar sacrifices. I took those sorts of things in my stride. But those silent halls terrified me. Maybe it was because I had an inclination as to what the computer's goals were. We passed room after room devoid of any living soul, and over time it became clear that it had been, that it had been something of an exodus. 
gurneys with bloodstains and bedpans knocked over, their contents half frozen to the floor, IV bags left dripping where the needle had been torn out and left dangling, blood streaked walls and beds with outlines of sweaty, un unwell people who were nowhere to be found. At one point, we found what I think was an open heart surgery patient who had he did the same terrible call as everyone else, including the surgeons who did not bother to close him up. He must have woken up after everyone else late to the party, but that didn't deter him. He rolled off the bed and crawled desperately. He didn't even remove the metal bar holding the ribcage open. He got a few meters before dying. When I flipped him over with a foot, I saw ribs splayed open like an ivory Venus flytrap, his organs covered in a thin veneer of frost, dead as a doornail, his lips blue and his eyes cloudy from ice, and yet somehow he looked damned happy to be lying there in his own awful. I grimaced at the sight and tried to pull it out of my mind, but the gleam in his eyes still haunts me. How far are we from pediatrics, I asked the guard. It's one floor off, a guard replied. Are we still getting a heat signature? He nodded. The stairwell was full of random bits of pieces. Pencils, phones, shoes, watches, all manners of little things that people left behind as they rushed the door in a terrible crowd. I saw a few teeth, a few spatters of blood. It, was, it all led to that one place. Inside the corridor was a mess, just like the stairwell. Nearly a thousand people had converged on one doorway at the end. Along the way, paintings had been torn off walls. Doors were put through so much strain, they buckled and broke. There were even bloodied handprints on the ceilings from where the crowd, hitting a bottleneck, had surged upwards as well as sideways into walls and through locked doors. And through locked doors. They had flowed through the hospital like a flood. What could have made people do this? Maya's assistant asked as we started to spot the first few people whose bodies had fallen and been able, unable to get back up. Crushed beneath the feet of the crowd, the corpses made for an ugly sight. Mostly, they looked like they'd been elderly, at least if the silver hair mat matted into gore was anything to go by. But a few of them were too small to be anything other than children. That computer has spent the last few hundred years trying to speak to God, I said. It's been screaming his name on and off for the last few decades. Sometimes it cooks up little side projects for fun, but mostly it all comes back to the, that singular goal. I turned to the armed men behind me. Tell the team outside to prep our facilities and teams for the Abraham procedure. There was a bustle of activity as each one reached to radios and tablets and began sending messages. Once it had faded and silence returned, and I gestured for all of us to carry on. I wouldn't bother, I said when I saw my assistant trying to take steps between the increasingly frequent corpses. It's only going to get worse. And it did until at least there was no floor to see. There was only carpet of discolored gowns and broken humans. All of them victims of unseen compulsion drawing them towards those doors. Two of them, each with a window painted black with blood and flesh. Just beyond lay our heat signature. Oh, it actually did, didn't it? I muttered to myself as I suppressed a shiver. Pardon? I m my assistant asked. Come on, I said, trying to, trying my best to seem chirpy. Let's go speak with one of God's representatives. I have to be close to the end. Almost. Inside was a little girl who paced like a tiger in a zoo. She didn't smile when she saw us, but she did stop and stare at us with eyes that could appear steel. Oh boy, I muttered, secretly glad no one could see the sweat pouring down my face. A survivor? My assistant asked, and I wondered if he paid attention to his surroundings. Much like outside this room had been coated with what seemed like half a foot of blood, meat, and muscle. Unlike outside, this flesh was still twitching. Nope, I said as I put a hand across his chest to stop his rushing towards her. It isn't like me to intervene on behalf of someone else's stupidity, but then again I don't like losing leverage either. 
It's the girl, I, he said. The one with the implant that you identify. Nope, I repeated. You look closer, perhaps come, coming to appreciate the absolute monstrous expression of hatred painted on her face. Okay, give me one second. Just in case um, I'm unable to finish this, I'm going to loop the music. Uh, he looked closer, perhaps coming to appreciate the absolutely monstrous expression of hatred painted on her face. That girl would have been the first to go, I said. Her head was used to admit sounds only they can hear. I gestured to the girl-shaped illusion that had now resumed its pacing. A summoning for an angel, something anyone with half a brain cell would never do. And unfortunately, this summoning worked. And when the angel arrived and realized it had been caught in a trap, it would have smashed whatever was making that noise into pieces, and then it would have summoned every living human in it could, it could to try and find whoever had set the bait. And for every person that couldn't help, it would have gotten angrier and angrier. And angrier. Until my assistant asked. And, or until my assistant asked. Until some arrived to inspect the trap. We could we could just let it go, he replied. The girl stopped pacing once more and looked at us. It would kill us if we were lucky. I said, I thought angels were good. The thing, these things are puppeteers, I said. They can play our nervous system like a fiddle and make us see or feel anything that they want us to. They can take us apart and put us back together in any arrangement they feel like. Because whatever put us on this earth left them behind so they can impregnate unwitting teenagers, split the Red Sea, and conjure whatever other miracles were needed. They were meant to be our caretakers, but they, like we were meant to be the caretakers of Earth. That sounds like good guys. Think about how we treated planet Earth, I snapped. Think about how we treat the birds and the animals. Think about industrial farming. Think about how we treat dogs, castration, sterilization. We breed them into disability, force them into incest, force them into incest, clip their ears, break their tails, euthanize them when it's convenient, breed them when it isn't, and they, I pointed to the girl, like us, a hell of a lot less than we like dogs. Let me go. I knew we'd been comprised, compromised the second we saw the girl as a girl and not a scuttling arachnid monstrosity larger than most cars. But I still jumped at the sound of that thing's voice. It meant it had a direct wiretap into our minds. Angels don't do wireless. Everything is physical. Something in that room were organic filaments, thinner than hair, but tougher than steel. And they'd already breached our suits and were communicating directly with our brain stems. Uh, no, I replied. Letting you out means that my final moments will be painful. But you're weak, that much is clear. And we've been pumping all sorts of nasty stuff into this place for two days straight. And I'm pretty sure that why I'm not trapped in a little nightmare of eternal suffering and degradation. Let me go. We're open to negotiation, I said with a cheerful tone, stone stolen from the barista I visited every morning. For a second, the illusion flickered, flickered in and out. The girl disappeared, and we all glimpsed a bramble-like knot of chitinous legs that concealed some unseen central mass. Only each limb was as thick as my thigh, and covered in undulating hairs and glistening black eyes. What is this? That's a picture. I'm not. I'm not clicking on that picture. You can go click on that for yourself. I felt an overwhelming desire to kneel. We will let you go, I said, if you allow us to go unharmed. We can shut the trap down. We have its creator and it's shown us not and it and it has shown us how. But we don't do that if it just means you're going to kill us. The barrage of images it put into my head as a response to this. Let's say it made Keith's last victim look like a Boy Scout. Most of Eldritch abominations don't have feelings the way we understand them, but angels do. They were deliberately sculpted to understand us in our worlds so they can better manipulate it from beyond the scenes. They're not alien, they're worse. They are jealous and spiteful and capable of putting the, these emotions to work on an unprecedented, unprecedented scale. 
This is the kind of hatred that prompts invisible genocides over some misplaced tea. Whole ethnic groups have been permanently scrubbed from our history because of these things. I'm talking violent eyes and naturally blue hair. Gone. All gone. We don't even remember them. If it wasn't for Agatha, neither would I. We could kill you, I said. You're not immortal. You're just a thing like us. Biological matter that can... Uh, that... That can come undone just as easily. Not quite as easily. Your official designation by the others, you know. You know the others? I replied. The blobs and the goat-footed fo breeders who go scuttling in dark places. The dwellers in the deep. The primor primordial oozes who were here long before you. They call you Ixodita after ticks. They, that's how they see you. You're a parasite that the kind of farmer has to pre protect his sheep from. That makes you livestock. Still, we're at, we are at an impasse, I said. You're dying. Even as I spoke, I could feel the facade of my plan start to crumble. There was no easy out in this situation, and I entered it terrified as to know how I was going to make it work. Angels are a sophisticated species, and they would be deeply unhappy to know that a bunch of primitives had gotten the better of one of their own. I'd hoped to try to try out some kind of negotiating, but that'd be like one of us negotiating with a stray dog that had bitten a child. No matter what happened, if this angel died, I could count on the others finding me. And that'd be the best case scenario, living a day or even a week. Unfortunately, I didn't even get that far. Without even appearing to move, the angel unmade the guards. I thought about this a lot, believe me, but there's no way I could describe it to you. They were pulled apart into the, their desperate tissues in the blink of an eye. A bloodless vivisection that struck the room like an explosion. Muscle, bone, eyes, teeth, skin, nerve endings. They were thrown against the walls and subsumed into the living carpet of flesh all around us. I had to suppress a whimper as I realized they were still alive, possibly even aware. Beside me, my assistant fell to his knees and began to weep, but I knew that no amount of begging or praying would change the angel's intentions. We just had to be... We just had to hope it'd be rel rel relatively quick and that the consequences wouldn't be. Your mind tastes awful, it boomed. The words so loud I fell to my knees as my willpower crumbled. Not like the others. How amusing. It, mu it has been so long since I bothered to keep a pet. It agreed to your terms? My boss has sat before like three judges at a tribunal. A man and two women with faces that looked like they'd been carved out of granite. The boardroom was supposed to be a professional environment where meetings could be ha had with other relevant departments, but in truth, it just turned into the site of disciplinary meetings like this. Something like that, I replied. One of them asked, why one of them asked? He was younger than we thought, just a few hundred years old. And thankfully for us, something of a history buff. That's why he heeded the signal from the hospital in the first place. Apparently, the creator is, is such of a taboo topic in the culture. He was hoping to learn a little more about it all. He has been thrilled to enter our organization from within and peruse our archives. And none of his, none of the, none of the others have come looking for him. The man, the man asked. No need, he is alive and well and enjoying himself, business as usual. There was a knock on the door and I turned to see my assistant poking his head through. He waved and smiled and showed me the tray of coffee he wanted to bring in. I smiled back and gave him a thumbs up. We were always led to believe angels and other Abrahamic abominations were not on the cards for this organization. Will he have trouble working with the program? One of the bosses asked as the young man placed the tray down and began to distribute drinks. Well, unlike others, they are actually very well versed in human mannerisms in our society. Not much rehabilitation to do, really. And of course, they can appear however they want, so long as they have direct line of sight. I answered. A lot of the time, they let our mind do the heavy work. We fill in the necessary blanks. If they appear as a policeman, We'll see anything we need to do in order to support that idea. Gun, badge, so on. 
Ultimately, it's our own minds that make their disguises so convincing without them even having to move. And what are you calling them? This angel? Uriel. Isn't that the name of the angel of death or something? I'm not entirely sure. My boss's eyes went wide as they processed the voice that they had been inserted directly into their mind. One by one, they lowered their drinks and turned to face my assistant. Even I, who had spent days with a walking nightmare, could not suppress a shiver. Sorry, he said before coughing to clear his, voice, clear, clear his throat. Force of habit. I like you, Ariel. He told me I couldn't pronounce his name. I explained as my assistant stood behind me and placed a single hand on my shoulder. I tried to ignore the taste of copper in my mouth and the intense inch at the back of my neck. So I let him pick an appropriate and respectful alternative. That's interesting. Is it all... Is it all real? Like, is it like a cover-up by the government? Let's read the comments. Need clarification, please. The angel took over the body of the 847th assistant, is that correct? Keith impersonated the priest, but Keith is an idiot, so the real not-idiot priest who was erased from existence went to an elder care home and did horrible things to the old people, is that correct? You are the worst boss in the history of ever, by the way. I give you a 0 out of 4 on your performance review. Yes to both. I have to say, you are real bad at your job, and most of your problems are caused by you. I didn't even realize that he was doing a lot of terrible things. I've had bosses... I've had bad bosses, but this guy is as incompetent as he is cruel. Wouldn't be surprised if he had accidentally entered our world because his assistant was too dead to bring him morning coffee. I didn't even realize that the boss was so, like, cruel. It's like, yeah, I knew he made a lot of terrible decisions. Like, letting, like, his assistants die and, like, people die. But, I don't know. Okay. So, here's the thing. I've been going for a while in this story. Oh, this story isn't that long. Um... Okay, I'll read one more story, because I'm not going to be posting another No Sleep for at least another year, probably. Um, and I wanted to read this, because I wanted to actually get, like, a spooky story. So, one more. Actually, let me drink some water first, just to be hydrated. Okay. When it's after midnight, we aren't allowed to go downstairs alone. The town I live in is nice. It's quiet, a little quaint. My dream is to move on to the city I once graduated from. College. I want a life where things are busier, more excited, more exciting, more alive. I live at home with my parents and my twin sister. Both of my parents are underpaid teachers, so our upbringing has been relatively modest. We've never been spoiled. We've always been told to work hard for every dollar and gratitude for everything we have been instilled in us since childhood. Uh, my parents must have worked really hard to save money throughout these years because the house that we've lived in since I was a teen is pretty darn huge. My tiny little town in general is relatively prestigious. I went online to search up the prices of houses in our neighborhood and wow. So I do my part to extract wisdom from my parents whenever possible. Clearly they know a thing or two about how to win at life. Of all the things my parents ask of me and my sister, the rule they are most, the most stern about is if you're going downstairs after midnight, you have to bring someone with you. Ever since we first moved to this house, they would remind us of this rule every chance they got. They randomly bring it up at the dinner table or before we, we'd go off to school. Sometimes, even if the footsteps in the hallway at night, one of them would get up from bed and walk with us to wherever in the house we were going. The strangest thing about it was that me and my sister never really had any reason to go downstairs at night anyways. Our rooms, the living room, the kitchen, and pretty much everything else we used was upstairs. Sure, downstairs had a games room and some stuff we maybe needed to pull out from storage from time to time, 
But overall, I couldn't think of a scenario where we needed to go downstairs after midnight. Is downstairs the ground floor or the basement? Unsure. I don't know if it's clarified. My sister and I would ask my parents about it sometimes. Why do we have this rule? What happens if we break it? They, us they would usually deflect, change the subject, or say, We'll tell you when you're older, dear. As I got older and older, the fact that my whole family slept upstairs in a large two-story house Okay, that answers my question. Mind you. Became increasingly weird to me. I was curious about what exactly was going on. So fresh on my 20th birthday, I decided to conjure up a situation where I would absolutely need to head downstairs after 12 a.m. Mom, I left my laptop in the games room and I need to polish up a paper that I'm submitting tomorrow. Lame excuse, I know. She was skeptical and pushed back a little bit. Can I get up early tomorrow and finish up the essay in the morning? Why did I leave this assignment until the last minute? I was able to ass assuage this the, the, the qu these questions pretty easily. I thought I was due two days from now. I thought my laptop was in my room. I lo I'm a little stressed and I won't be able to sleep if I don't finish it, etc, etc. So she ultimately obliged. We made our way down the small staircase and arrived at the door leading to the downstairs area. Before my mother opened it, she turned to me. Okay, he's likely going to latch onto me. Make sure I don't open the door to the backyard, okay? Make sure I'm with you at all times. You can pull me if you need to. I thought she was kidding. She opened the door. Our downstairs area has another small living, air living room, a small kitchen, and a hallway that leads to our games room and our storage area. I'd accidentally left my laptop in the games room as we entered, and I immediately turned down towards the hallway. I thought my mom would follow me. Instead, I saw her just standing there, shivering, jittery. Her gaze was fixed on the window in the kitchen. It's a big window with the, line with the blinds usually pick pulled up. The window was a peek into our large, mostly empty backyard. I looked at my mom confusedly as she continued her uninterrupted stare. Slowly, she started walking to the door to our backyard. Mom, what are you- That's when I saw him, pressed against the window from the outside. His face was obscured by the darkness, but I could see his eyes wide open. Wider than eyes should go, otherworldly, he looked focused, excited. Uh, my mom continued to walk, walking toward the door. I grabbed her as hard as I could and pulled her away, back to the staircase leading upstairs. I closed the door behind us. It took my mom a moment to snap out of it. She spent another minute staring at the door to the downstairs area, meekly trying to open it and go back to where... She was previously walking to when she finally pulled herself together. What the fuck was that? Did you get your laptop, hon? Mom, what the fuck was outside the window? Mom's reaction was weird. A mix of annoyance, concern, and fear. She finally responded. Terrible things happen when we talk about him too much. As long as we go downstairs in pairs of two, we're always okay. No one lets him in yet. And that was that. I continued asking her as we made our way upstairs, but she just flat out ignored me at this point. I had no idea what to do. I wanted to tell my sister, who was generally super carefree, but part of me thought it would only freak the hell it only freaked the hell out of her and achieved nothing. I tried bugging my dad about it, but he also deflected. At most, sometimes he'd say something like, We just wanted to make sure we could give you and your sister a comfortable upbringing, and then walk away. What the fuck? It's been two years since me and my mom went downstairs together after midnight. Since then, we've continued to follow the rule and thank thankfully never run into any problems. I tried to convince my parents that we should try, we should think about downsizing and moving somewhere else, but they'd always say like stuff like, that isn't how this works, dear. And as long as we play it safe after midnight, we'll be okay. That brings me to why I'm writing this today. My parents have been gone for a week, visiting family in, other, in another state. My sister left earlier this evening to go to a sleepover with her best friend. I'm ho home alone for the first time in forever. You're going to go downstairs, aren't you? I don't usually have a phone on me. It takes me a couple hours at least to read and respond to text messages. I've always been lazy about it. I recently took... A look at my phone and to see a missed text message from my sister. 
Hey, I might have accidentally left the downstairs open. Just an FYI. Please close it when you get a chance. Jesus Christ. She sent this text message four hours ago. I read it at 10 minutes past midnight. I'm writing this from the closet in my room. So far, I think I'm okay. Maybe she's misremembering and she kept the door shut. The only thing I'm worried about is that I'm starting to shiver a little bit. And I have this inexplicable urge to get out from my hiding spot so that he can find me. Fuck that sister. It's like, you know the rules. How could you forget? What is it with parents on this sub and refusing to give a simple life-saving explanation? The real horror is the lack of communication. That is absolutely fair. I love that comment. Because that's exactly how I feel when I read these stories. But didn't you hear? Vaguely bad things will happen if they speak about it too much. Which obviously means they shouldn't speak of it at all. Vague threats to not go downstairs. Fucking nothing about making sure the door is shut. That is fair. That, that, that is fair. It's like they said nothing about making sure the door is shut. They just said not to go downstairs. But anyways. That's gonna do it for no sleep this year. Um, because this is the second to last video I'm recording for October. And um, I think that's enough stories for now. Next year I'll try to be better at finding more themes. Or maybe not. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But in the meantime, thank you everyone for listening. I'm not good with outros, so I'll catch you in the next one. Sleep well.